such a pleasure to see each and every one of you. My name is Sean Newton, one of your hosts. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to Salem State University's 33rd annual Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. celebration. Yesterday, we had a great kickoff event during our annual Martin Luther King Jr. candlelight vigil, where we heard from students, staff, and community members alike. As I look around the room, I actually see a few of them here again today. Many of them reflected on the words of Dr. King and what they meant to him. Then it culminated with a march from this very same room down to the Nancy Harrington campus. It's important for me to recognize Dr. Lee Brassois, who actually created that program back in 1991. And it's still going strong today, so thank you, Lee. Today's gathering is special, not because we're gathering in person after some time for some pandemic thing that was going on, but also because it's the 60th anniversary of Dr. King's famous I Have a Dream speech that he gave during the March on Washington that was held August 28, 1963. We all know, and if you don't, I'm here to tell you that for something to become true, we must first believe that it is possible. We must dream of it first. Like getting your degree at Salem State, or making a difference in the field of your choice and in your community. Dr. King's dream, however, was a little deeper than that, like believing that one day in our communities, that sweltered with injustice and the heat of oppression, that it would be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. He dreamed that racially diverse people can walk together as sisters and brothers and that barriers for progress would be removed and that with all that life has to bring regarding the work and struggle, that we do it together with the hopes that we let freedom ring and that we as a people will one day be free at last. I'm really excited about today's program, today's guest speaker, Dr. Mary Frances Berry, and those that helped make today possible. So without further ado, I'd like to start by introducing our interim vice president for diversity and inclusion, Dr. Kasia Valens. Please help me welcome her to the stage. Thank you all for coming. Um, I want to ask uh, to, for a moment to acknowledge that the land occupied by Salem State University is part of Namkeag, a traditional and ancestral homeland of the Pawtucket Band of the Massachusetts. To acknowledge the genocide and forced removal of the people of Namkeag and their kin. To recognize the ongoing colonization and dispossession of indigenous homelands. And to offer respect, honor, and gratitude to the Massachusetts tribe and the many indigenous people who continue to care for the land upon which we gather. Respect, honor, and gratitude are shown through statements and carried out through actions. May this land acknowledgement also mark a commitment to continuously learn and share the history of the Massachusetts and indigenous people who have been and remain here to make our own environmental impact on this land as sustainable as possible. To work toward repairing the injustices continuously being committed on the indigenous people of this land through renewed and ongoing engagement with the Massachusetts and all indigenous people in and around Salem State. Our gathering today also offers respect and honor for the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And what better way to do that than to carry on his legacy of activism and advocacy that springs from the roots of local community and reaches across the world, tirelessly demanding justice for all. Welcome to our community today. In gratitude to those who have come before us, alongside those who lead the charge for equity and freedom now 
and I'm really pleased to see our university leaders, our um, city leaders, our school leaders here with us today. Thank you. And most of all, the next generation of leaders, students today, who will keep on keeping on. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Valens. I really appreciate those words. Next, I'd like to introduce a person who is uh, dear to this university. Uh, I like to call this person uh, my president and the only president that I know. <laughs> Mr. John D. Keening, president of Salem State University, who gives some greetings on behalf of Salem State. I know you know President Biden. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you, Dean Newton, and great to be with all of you uh, here today. I also wanted to acknowledge some of our partners in the audience, certainly uh, Annalisa De Palma, who's the chair of our foundation board, thank you for joining us, uh, and our new mayor, uh, our new mayor, Bob McCarthy, I want to thank you for joining us today. And thank you to Superintendent Steve Zreich from Salem, Salem as well. We have been a great partner in early college and everything else we're doing, so thank you for joining us today as well. Um, so today we do reflect on the 60th anniversary of Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech. This historic speech delivered, as was said, on August 28, 1963. I was not born yet. At the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, recalled another speech 100 years earlier whose promises had yet to be fully realized. Dr. King called on his audience to demand and work for the fulfillment of the promises of American democracy made on the occasion of the Emancipation Proclamation. Now, 60 years later after that speech in Washington, we recall Dr. King. His call still resonates today. We must continue to rise to his call to demand and work for the fulfillment of the still unmet promises of American democracy. We must continue to dream, to demand, and to work for equity, justice, and freedom. We must embrace this work. Indeed, one might suggest the new sculpture just unveil, unveiled in Boston last week inspires such efforts. At this annual celebration on this momentous anniversary, we gather to do just that, embrace the work. Although we're here today to celebrate, I just also want to take a moment to recognize the senseless shooting that happened in Monterey Park just yesterday. It is terrible that such an act of violence occurred as one of the most joyous days was being celebrated. Please join me for a moment of silence in recognition of all the lives lost due to senseless violence in this country. Thank you. I congratulate all of those being recognized today for their contributions to furthering the cause of freedom, equity, and justice. Your contribution and care for others continues the spirit of leadership inspired by Dr. King and demonstrated in his speech. I want to thank all those who put together today's work, the Martin Luther King Collaborative, Kate Adams, Melissa Arroyo, Lee Broussois, Lucy Corchado, Nicole Harris, Mike Mitchell, Laurie Mullins, Sean Newton, Bruce Perry, Cheryl Price, and Keisha Valens. I want to thank you for all that you do for our campus. And I certainly want to congratulate all the honorees that are being recognized today for the work they do day in and day out, making Salem and Salem State a better place. Congratulations and welcome to Salem State. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, President Keenan. Last semester, there was a call to nominate members of our campus community for the Martin Luther King Jr. Leadership Award. Although there were many deserving nominees, you may have seen their names flash up on the screen earlier. Five will be recognized today, and their names are also listed in today's program. 
I'd like to call out the names of this year's recipients and will ask that you stand when you hear your name and remain standing until the last name is read. Please hold your applause until the end. Thank you. I'm not sure if everyone's here, but I'll do my best to make sure that we recognize you. First, I do believe I see Michael Corley, who is our student recipient. If you're here, please stand. Michael was our previous student government president. Thank you. Manny Martinez. Manuel Cures Martinez was chosen as our graduate student recipient. Thank you for standing. Dr. Elisa Castillo was chosen as our staff administrator recipient. I know Elisa, her and I work in the same office. <laughs> and Dr. Elsbeth Slater was chosen as our faculty recipient. Thank you. And finally, Hope Watt Bucci was chosen as our alumni recipient. Thank you, Hope. Please. I see the cameras flashing. Thank you so much for uh, congratulating these recipients. You may not have a seat. Thank you so much. Next, I'd like to recognize our 2023 Salem Public School Essay Writing Contest winners. Today, we actually have our Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Steven Strike here. Thank you for coming. Like before, I ask the recipients to stand when your name is called and remain standing. If we want everyone else, please hold your applause until the end. Their names are also located in the program. I had a quick opportunity to introduce myself to all of them, and it puts a super big smile on my face to shake the hands of not only our young leaders of today, but the ones who we know will be shaping the future for tomorrow. The first person that I'd like to ask to stand is Mary a song. She goes to Witchcraft Heights and is in grade five. She's sitting right over there just so that everyone can see who she is. Our middle school recipient is Janelle Patchy, grade eight in the New Liberty Innovation School. Thank you very much for coming. Oh my gosh, okay, I didn't even notice. We have a... <laughs> It looks, it looks like they're accompanied by a Salem State alum also, so sorry, I get, I get, carried, I get carried away every now and then. All right. Um, and then Tyreek Jones. Where are you, Tyreek? This young man goes to Salem High School and is in the ninth grade. Please join me in congratulating this year's Salem Public School SA winners. Thank you so much, you may be seated. <clears throat> Salem State really appreciates our partnership with the city and are extremely proud of our young leaders already making an impact on the world. Last but not least, certainly not least, I'd like for us to recognize the 2023 Salem State Racial Justice Writing Contest winners. I ask that the recipients please stand when your name is called and to remain standing. For everyone else, please hold your applause to the end. The names are also located in your program. The first person I'd like to recognize is a graduate student winner, Vasiliki Tordis. Please stand if you're here. Thank you very much. And our undergraduate winner, Alex Cepeda. Are you here, Alex? Yes, thank you. Please give them a round of applause. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. At this time, I'd like to introduce Bettina Escalá, who is our Vice President of the Black Student Union 
and class of 2023 who will introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Francis, Mary Francis Barry. Please help me welcome Patina. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for the introduction. Um, it is an honor to be here today, and I would like to also congratulate this year's Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Leadership Award winners. Our keynote address for the convocation will be delivered by author, activist, educator, and historian, Dr. Mary Frances Berry. For more than 40 years, Dr. Frances Berry has been one of the most visible and respected activists in the cause of civil rights, equality, and social justice. Serving as the chairperson of the United States Civil Rights Commission, Dr. Berry has led the charge for equal rights and liberties for all Americans over the course of four presidential administrations. A trailblazer, a trailblazer for all women, she also became the first woman of any race to head a research university as chancellor of the University of Colorado at Boulder. She is the Geraldine R. Segal Professor at of American Social Thought and Professor of History at the, United, at the University of Pennsylvania, where she teaches history of American law and the history of law and social policy. We are looking forward to hearing her thoughts and to be inspired by her. Immediately following, we will hold a brief question and answer period facilitated by Dean Newton. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Mary Frances Berry with a big Salem State applause. Thank you very, very much. I'm always happy to be in Massachusetts, especially after I've been to such awful places before. Uh, I won't name all of the awful places that I've been to, but let me thank uh, President Keenan, uh, who's here instead of out trying to raise money. Uh, or maybe this is a way to raise money, who knows, uh, for the university. Uh, and uh, let me thank uh, uh, everyone here who was responsible for inviting me on this occasion. And I hope that I will not say anything that will make you think that you shouldn't have invited me. <laughs> and uh, so we, you have done the most important part of the business of this occasion. And that is to recognize and acknowledge all of the people who have done uh, the kinds of things that we want people to do to help improve the quality of life in this community and this country and to get experience in doing that. So let me congratulate all of the recipients of the awards that have been announced. Thank you. Um, what I want to do is, and I will try to fit it into the time that I have remaining that the schedule shows that I should have already finished. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to do that, but I'll try. Uh, and in any case, let me just say that we're talking about Martin Luther King and his vision. And one of the things I wanted to make sure I did is to talk about your school of education, the McKeon School of Education here, and how important it was for it to be supported in the way that it was uh, by an alumnus of the institution. We have a major shortage of teachers in this country, in case you haven't noticed. Um, and we have a, even a more major shortage of good teachers <laughs> in this country. And so uh, whatever anybody can do <laughs> to try to improve uh, this situation and to help us to well educate future generations is really uh, major importance, and I'm glad to see that at Salem State you're doing this. Now, I am not going to tell a joke about witches, you know, uh, and that's because whenever Christmas comes around, people walk up to me and say, Merry Christmas, Mary Berry, and then they laugh, ah, ha, 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 like they think it's funny. Uh, so, and I don't find it funny at all, so I'll just have to say that. Let me say that we're talking about Martin Luther King and I suppose the points that I would make is that at this time of year when I go out to talk about Martin Luther King, uh, it is bittersweet for me 
uh, every year when this happens. Uh, it is bittersweet because I like talking about and thinking about his legacy, which I do most of the time. It's been something that has been one of the pole stars of my life. Uh, but I also am very sad because I think about the way he died. And I think about Coretta, with whom I established a deep friendship in all those years after Martin was dead and I grew up and became a public figure myself. And we became, as Coretta called it, uh, fellow pilgrims <laughs> on the way to trying to do something about uh, justice. Uh, is it off? Microphone. My microphone is off? Then how can you hear me? <laughs> <laughs> I it's mean, not off. They just want to move it. Pre President Keenan was smiling, so uh, it made it sound like I was saying something. Uh, did you hear any of what I said? It's on? Oh, okay. All right. Well, because I don't want to have to repeat all that. Uh, in any case, uh, fellow pilgrims in the cause of justice. And what I know about Martin Luther King, I learned from studying him, following him, and everything that Coretta and her son, uh, the one son that I know, Marty, uh, has told me about him over the years and the things that we've shared. Now, what they wanted to do, these people who were what I call the Moses generation of civil rights leaders, was to try to align reality with the great documents of our national life. That's all they were really trying to do in a legal sense. I mean the Declaration of Independence and the preamble to the Constitution. That's really <laughs> all they were trying to do uh, in their lives. And they made some progress, and we always have to say that because if I don't say that, people say to me, you don't acknowledge that any progress has been made. Rah, rah, rah. Anyway, uh, yes, we've made major progress in terms of improving the conditions for marginalized and the opportunities for marginalized people in our society. And I could name all the different groups, and I usually like to. <laughs> but uh, I mean people of color, I mean um, LBGTQ people, I mean women, I mean all the groups that have been the poor people who have been marginalized uh, in our society. But it is uh, apt to note that we have not made the kind of progress we would hope. One of the things I thought for a long time was that we would end the kind of division and polarization that exists in our country, and everybody talks about it, uh, by focusing on climate change. I thought that I made some commencement speeches in which I said, everybody's going to be behind everything. I was wrong, because <laughs> not everybody was behind it, uh, as we just had a uh, discussion at Davos where as somebody pointed out in a cartoon that all those folks who came there ranting and raving about it left in private airplanes. And not only did they leave there in private airplanes, they fly everywhere <laughs> in private airplanes uh, without regard to what's going on. And that it's more like Greta Thunberg says when she says they go to meetings and they go blah, 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 blah. And they don't do what they say they're going to do. But anyway, I still have hopes. But. Um, the main thing is that what Martin Luther King wanted to do was to create what he called the beloved community. And all he meant by the beloved community was that all human beings are equal and ought to have an equal opportunity to fulfill whatever dreams and promises that they have. And that's everybody. <laughs> and that that would be the beloved community. And there are all kinds of ways to try to achieve it now we talk about, for a while we talked about things like affirmative action, and then the court told us we couldn't do that. So then we changed the name to diversity, and then uh, which the higher education institutions proposed, including the one where I am a faculty member and the folks up here in Cambridge and so on. But um, then we, uh, now we have a court case in which the Supreme Court may decide that we can't call it that. Well, my idea is that what we do is just call it banana. That would be sufficient. Just, just keep changing the name. I mean, if it was affirmative action and it becomes diversity, banana would be, don't you think, would be a good name for Cheerios. I don't know. Anyway, just keep on trying to make the kind of progress uh, that has been slow to come if we want to be real 
um, and uh, just keep on trying to do it. But in any case, there are other ways to do it. There is uh, what the Moses generation did. There is protest, uh, direct action protest, I hasten to say. When I said protest on the Daily Show with Trevor, Noah Trevor uh, passed me a little piece of paper and said, you better say nonviolent <laughs> because people are going to say that you're trying to, you know, engage in violence and tear up people or something, which I meant and said. But the beloved community trying to create it um, and uh, make effective a change. Martin Luther King, the important, one of the important things to remember about him is how young he was. He was like 15 um, when he entered Morehouse College as a student. And Benny Mays was the president, and Benny was one of the grand old men of higher education and of African-American leadership in the South. And in the year before he died, he and I had the pleasure of sitting on the porch at Oberlin College, the president's house at Oberlin College, on a beautiful day. They were having commencement, and Benny and I sat out there and talked and made everybody late for everything that they were doing. <laughs> because we were telling, he was telling me all the stories about Martin. And I, I listen to every story <laughs> I can hear anywhere about from the people. And so I got Benny's uh, story about him and how he nurtured him and how he uh, couldn't speak very well, which would surprise you uh, perhaps at first, and how he sort of trained himself and worked on trying to speak in ways that people would listen to and might find um, uh, interesting, and even that his classmates might interest, <laughs> listen to what, what he had to say when he was garbling things, when he was talking. He always wrote beautifully without worrying about grammar, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but uh, the speaking came uh, late. And then, of course, he was 25 um, when he got his PhD, uh, came up here uh, to Boston. Uh, in Massachusetts and tried to read everything he could find about everything because <laughs> uh, he said that even though his daddy was a preacher and his granddaddy was a preacher, he wanted to be a really educated preacher, not a jack leg preacher as we call him in the South, but somebody who was really uh, educated. So he spent his time reading all kinds of stuff. Um, and that is where he met uh, Coretta. Now, one could argue that he had a narrow experience when he was in Massachusetts at BU because he hung around with all the students and the people on the campus and the middle class people. He never went, spent time in poverty neighborhoods or anything like that. He was too busy reading everything uh, he could read and courting uh, Coretta in the end. But anyway, and when he was chosen to head the Montgomery bus boycott, and he was chosen, Students all ask me very often, how do you become a leader? And I say, well, Martin Luther King didn't have a leader written on his belly button when he was born. It didn't say, leader, here comes a leader. Uh, but he was chosen, and he became a leader. And movements turn people into leadership. Social movements do that to people. Social movements did that to Fannie Lou Hamer. Social Movements did that to Unita uh, uh, Blackwell. Social movements did that to Casey Hayden, who died the other day. Uh, social movements uh, do that to people. You get sort of uh, burnished, and you go, you know, it makes you, if you respond uh, to it, it makes scars, but it makes you uh, into a leader. So they picked him. And at the time that they picked him, he didn't know what he was going to do, <laughs> actually. He had some ideas, and it all worked out. He came back to the East and to, Mass to Washington to give his spur first coming out speech, I call it, um, at the uh, prayer, prayer pilgrimage in 1957. First time he had been on a national stage. And he talked about voting, and he said that if we just have the vote, we won't have to ask anybody for anything because people will pay attention to us and they'll respond and they'll do what we say because they know that they have to get us to vote for them. So that's why trying to get the vote 
is the most important thing we can give. We'll have judges that are fair every day of their lives. Uh, we will have all of this. You know, it was like real utopia. Uh, I said to Coretta, I said, why did he go up to Washington and spend all that time talking about what would happen if he had the vote? He just came from Montgomery. And the boycott was not settled because of voting. I mean, the people didn't get the buses desegregated because of voting. They got it desegregated because of their actions on a daily basis and the travail that they went through. So why did he do that? And she said, she looked at me, and she said, well, the, the topic was voting, and the elders had invited him for his first coming out speech, and so he talked about voting. <laughs> that was what he was supposed to talk about. Well, for a long time, he, and he got the Nobel Peace Prize and all that stuff, but he talked about voting, and we had all those struggles that you know about if you know the history, all the marches and all the going to jail and the people getting killed and in the prisons being filled. Mississippi, the prisons, most of the people in them were women and children. People forget that. They were women and children, their children who were in the prison. Um, and he did all that and they, we got the vote. And then something happened, something happened. What's happened? Um, then after that, he went to Chicago. And when he went to Chicago, it had a uh, major influence on his thinking and what he thought he ought to say and what he ought to do. When he was in Chicago, living in the poor communities, remember when he was in Boston, he didn't live in the poor communities. He didn't spend time doing that, okay? And they went back to the South. And Coretta says, we went back to home because we wanted to be part of whatever happened there. She was from Marion, Alabama. Um, and that's why we went back. We could have stayed, <laughs> you know, up in the North, and we didn't. Well, after he was in Chicago, and he would talk to people about voting, and that if voting, you know, you could solve your problems and so on. And guess what they said to him? They said, man, we've been voting <laughs> for years. Years. The precinct captains all make sure we vote. Yeah, they are accountable for getting us <laughs> to the polls. And do you see these rats and roaches and this poverty and all the stuff that besets us? And it's been besetting us for years. So why are you telling us that if we just vote, everything will be fine? It probably is not true. <laughs> and so he started mulling over and talking about it and whining to Coretta and so on about what was going on and what he ought to say and where he ought to go. And then he thought about the war in Vietnam and all the money that was being spent and how Lyndon Johnson, who he liked Lyndon Johnson very much, he had problems with JFK for a while because JFK and Bobby thought at first that the civil rights types like him were going to disappear, that they would get bored and go do something else and they wouldn't have to bother with them. It's in their papers, which I used when, uh, before a book I was writing. Um, and then it was the Meredith, James Meredith, Mississippi, that changed, uh, changed Bobby and, 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 and JFK and got them on that right track. But at the time that he was dealing with them and trying to get meetings, because uh, JFK had said in his campaign that once he was in office, he could end housing discrimination with the stroke of a pen. That's what he said. He said that so many times during the campaign. So after he got elected, Martin and the SCLC wanted a meeting with him so he, they could watch him end housing discrimination. <laughs> with the stroke of the pen, and he wouldn't have a meeting with them. And he and Bobby said to each other, I have this, it's in the papers over there, that, uh, ah, these people, are, they're gonna go away, you know, it's just one of those blips on the whatever. And they didn't go away. And then he invited Martin to come to the 100th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. And he didn't invite him personally, Louis Martin, who was one of his uh, assistants, and who was a black guy who had been a newspaper editor in Chicago, uh, at one time and was a real political operative uh, and PR guy told us that he invited every Negro whose name had ever been mentioned anywhere in public 
<laughs> to come to the 100th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation for JFK, and that was so the Republicans wouldn't be able to invite him. And he'd get them all come <laughs> there instead, since it was Lincoln and Springfield, he figured the Republicans were gonna invite him. So he, and Martin said, well, look, I am not coming, but I tell you what, I'll come if you're going to uh, end housing discrimination with the stroke of your pen. And as a matter of fact, we could like bring a pen <laughs> if that's what's stopping you, you know? I mean, really. So anyway, they had a you know, sort of shaky uh, relationship, but Johnson, he really liked, and he liked the fact that Johnson had, after the protests and so on, signed the voting rights and all that stuff that he had done. And he didn't want to really upset him, but he said, this war in Vietnam doesn't make any sense. Look at all that money we're spending. Look at all the money that could go for some of those things those people were talking about when they were there uh, in Chicago. He could have found some of that in Boston, but he, at that time he wasn't looking. And so um, he said he decided to give that speech at Riverside uh, Church in New York about the war in Vietnam. And it was the immorality, the deaths, the dying, and he was a pacifist, but it was also the money <laughs> that could have gone for something else to help human beings. And the speech was written and he read it and he said, I'm not gonna give that speech. And he agonized over it. And then he said, it was like fire shut up in his bones. In Jeremiah, if you read Jeremiah, Jeremiah talks about how, in the Bible, about how you say you're not going to say something. I'm going to go there no matter what they do and what they, I'm not saying a word. And then you get there and you don't know what happened to you. But it's like fire shut up in your bones. And he said, I couldn't be still. I, I, I had to do it. And so he did it. And he talked about the evil of it and how it ought to stop and all the rest. And he was criticized. He was often criticized in that period. People forget that. They think that it was all hunky-dory after Montgomery and everybody loved Martin Luther King. That's just crazy. <laughs> it's not crazy. It, it is crazy. And so he did it, the speech. And what that did was to confirm to him that you needed nonviolent civil disobedience to change things and that voting is important, but it's not everything. There's, as the guys told him in Chicago, there's got to be something else, Reverend. There's got to be something else to go with it, and that it went with him. And that's why when he went to, uh, he wrote that, uh, uh, Where Do We Go From Here? The last book that he wrote before he was assassinated, which he actually wrote himself. It is quite common for public figures and important people to get other people to write things for them. People always ask me, why don't you get somebody to write whatever it is, and then you can go with us to wherever we're going, and you won't have to stay, say, I can't go because I got to write this. <laughs> and I said, no, because I want to write it myself. He went off with his notes and his mind and everything else and wrote it himself. And what he basically says in it is that you have to be willing to put yourself on the line. You have to be willing. You should vote, yes. But you have to remember that politicians want one thing first. They want you to vote for them, OK? And then what else do they want next? They want you to vote so they can get reelected. <laughs> that's what they do. It's not that they're bad people or anything like that, but that's what the game is about. And that unless you get somebody to agree to do something before you vote for them, Black Lives Matter did that, which I thought they sent out notes to everybody, including people like me and everybody, that when the campaign was, the last presidential campaign was up, we should not talk about these issues we had been talking about for a while. We should just focus on voting. And not only should we focus on it, we shouldn't ask the candidates to promise to do anything, because that would be insulting. We should wait until after we get them in, and then we go and ask them to do something. I wrote a note back, and I said, this is crazy. <laughs> I've never heard anything so crazy in my whole life. I said, if you want somebody to do something, you have to ask them when they need you. <laughs> and then 
that's the strategy. And everybody was using that strategy, except me, I was crazy, so I stayed at home and, and uh, managed my own business. Uh, but in any case, so they didn't get what they wanted. So what we learn from where we go from here is that some people, when they decide to do something, and Coretta and I, whenever some issue and we were uh, going to participate in some kind of opposition to something or trying to get something done, we would always ask ourselves, what would Martin do? Now, that didn't mean we always did what he would do. <laughs> but we would respectfully ask, what would Martin do? And we would look, you know, and it said, you know, in where do we go from here? You can see it in there where he talks about how uh, some people always ask, is it popular? And if it's not popular, they're going to do it. And I have put that in different ways, that if Rosa Parks had taken a poll before she sat down on the bus, she wouldn't have sat down. And then well, Miss Parks sitting down on the bus wouldn't be a story. <laughs> but she didn't take a poll. She acted. Or that you could say that he also said that some people ask, if I do this, will somebody attack me? And, you know, will I be taking a risk? And he said, that is not, that's cowardice when you do that. That's cowardice. So don't do that. He said, what you ought to do is ask yourself, is this the right thing to do? And if it's the right thing to do, have the courage to just, you know, it's the fire shut up in your bones. It's what I did when, after I heard the Riverside speech, and I was decided to go to Vietnam and, I was in the anti-war movement at Michigan, and I decided to go to Vietnam and to, in fact, um, see for myself what was going on. And again, people thought I was crazy. Uh, the other people in the movement with me, they said, how are you going to go to Vietnam and see what's going on? And I wrote a letter to the Secretary of Defense and said, how do you go to Vietnam to see what's going on? And they wrote back and they said, you don't. And I wrote again and said, well, there are other people seeing what's going on. How, how do I get? They said, you got to be a reporter or you got to be in the military. Well, I wasn't going to join the military. How do you get to be a reporter? You got to have 200,000 subscribers, print subscribers. Go over to the Michigan Daily, ask them for, to support you as their reporter. Go to the, the papers around Ann Arbor, I was at Michigan. Ask them if they want a war correspondent. And they'll say yes and get a letter from them. Uh, they don't have to pay you. They don't have money anyway. And they made me a reporter, a war correspondent. They gave me credentials, and I went to Vietnam. Again, it was fire shut up in my bones. And so um, what you do is you do that. When Coretta was asked if she would come out publicly and say she supported gays being in the military when Clinton was agonizing over that, the answer was, she, she called me up and she said, you know, the men who were with Martin tell me not to do that, that it's too risky, that I should mind my own business. <laughs> so what? What would Martin do? Martin would do it. And so she said, come down to Atlanta, stand with me outside, and I'll do it. And I went down to Atlanta and stood with her. And the men who were with Martin didn't come except one came at the last minute. Joe Lowry came and stood with us, and we did it. Uh, or when we were with the last march concerning the uh, Haitian refugees marching around from the White House, and it was Arthur Ashe's last, his last march, poor Arthur, because he died after that. And it was hot as I don't know what, and Coretta wasn't feeling well, and they brought her in a car, and we were marching around. And I said, well, maybe we should go over there and sit down <laughs> in the shade. And she said, no, Mary Frances, we can't do that. Just, you know, wipe away the sweat, because this may be the last time we will all be together. So let's do what we have to do. So all I have to say is that when I was young, I used to think I'd change the world. You know, I'd say, oh, in a few years, the whole world will be changed and I will be a part of it. I don't believe that anymore. <laughs> but I do believe in incremental change. And I hope that some of you will go forward with that message and be part of the change because I really do believe that it is the responsibility of each generation to make its own dent in the wall of injustice. Thank you very much.
think they would do is that's an answer, but I have them sit over here in the chair. First, thank you for being here and sharing uh, your insights. You mentioned the affirmative action case that uh, primarily impacts selective schools. But I also wonder, you said, uh, what would happen? And I, and I wonder what your thoughts are, what he would think of that decision that the Supreme Court is likely to make later on this year. Well, first of all, we would be hoping that, and he would be hoping, that they would make a decision that recognized the necessity for doing something. In other words, what the Supreme Court, different judges, what they did in the Bakke case was when they decided that people weren't supposed to do something called affirmative action at the time, they accepted the proposal from the schools to do what we now call diversity, and equity, and inclusion, uh, which doesn't do as much, but you know, neither one of them has done <laughs> as much as they ought to do. The hope is that when they think about it, if they decide to say diversity is somehow inimical to the Constitution or something, 14th Amendment, they will accept some other approach uh, to doing it. If they don't, then what we do is we relabel it. I was serious about that. I've been relabeling things all my life in policy terms. Uh, and then figuring out a way to do the little bit that I can do. Uh, some of the universities where they have had these affirmative action referenda in Michigan, California, and so on, they have found ways to off-campus amass resources from donors that they then give to students and programs that are not officially connected with the campus and have managed to keep up some progress in terms of students by doing that. And without ever mentioning any of these things, I give to some of those programs. Uh, it is possible to, uh, to do that without loud mouthing about it, because if you do that, then the same groups that are suing <laughs> will say, I don't know what they're doing now. We ought to sue them on, on that. But that's what I would do. It's being strategic. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Kimberly Jones. I'm from the San State. I'm working um, as the Assistant Director of Career Services. And I just thank you. I am just so honored to be in your presence and to, to be a part of this. I am interested in your sharing Well, I wish I knew. <laughs> I, I, I could make some guesses, but I wish I knew. Uh, the, um, well, part of it, I guess, is my parents, my mother, actually, and that whole family of Southalls in Tennessee who grew up on the Southall Plantation as slaves and who are my mother's whole family side. And uh, how they, even though they had little or no education, she, had, uh, she was the youngest of 12 children, that they decided that all their children were gonna go to college. 
how did they, because they heard other people went to college <laughs> and it seemed to make some kind of, you know, good thing that they could do. So they were determined. And I don't know how they did it, but all of my cousins, uh, there are numerous cousins and children of cousins, uh, went to college except two. And those two refused to go. They just, you know, whatever you did to them, you could beat them with a whip. They weren't going to go to no college. They were going to get a job, you know, waste all that time, you know, whatever. Or go in the army or whatever. But um, they worked hard all their lives and did all kinds of things to make that happen. My mother's story to me is how she, as the youngest, a mother died in childbirth with her and the older ones raised her, how she would be, her job was to take the mule down from the farm where her daddy sharecropped and to take the, young, the older kids across the creek so they could go the miles to school. School's way down on the other side of the creek. So they could go through the third grade. So, and so they could go when the crops didn't need to be planted or not in. And she would go down, take the mule, as a little girl, and then she would come back again, and then she would come when they got out of school <laughs> and bring each one. They would come across. The mule would take you know, on across. And that was her work, you know, <laughs> when she was a child. And she was very proud of that. Uh, I also was in an orphanage for a time when my mother um, couldn't afford to do anything else. My father left us. Um, and uh, my earliest memory is my brother, who was older than me, crying. And I didn't know why he was crying. Later on, I asked him, and he said he was hungry all the time because they didn't feed us. And it was like a Charles Dickens, you know, one of those stories. Um, and the, um, and I, but I had good teachers. That was the other thing. I had teachers who believed in me. And one in particular who was my high school teacher, Minerva, who was my friend my entire life until she passed away. And she just said to me, she looked at me one day and she said, you're a diamond in the rough. <laughs> it's okay though, she said. And she would do wonderful things. Uh, and she would have children come over after school to her house uh, where she and her husband and her mother lived. And she'd give me things to read and then she would talk to me about them. And I remember when she told me uh, when I was about to graduate from high school, would you like to look at some schools up north to go to college? And I said, we were in Nashville. I said, I don't know. I didn't even know there were any schools up north. <laughs> so I didn't know what she was talking about. <laughs> But uh, I don't know, it's, it's just, uh, and part of it's spiritual. I'm a primitive Baptist. I don't know if you know what that is, but anyway. Um, so I don't know, but I do know that I don't like being, sometimes I don't like the being the way I am because I never give up. <laughs> I'm tenacious. I don't care what the risks are. I'm never afraid. I don't care if I lose or win or whatever. I always ask Martin's questions. And if I think it's right, I may be wrong even when I think it's right. <laughs> but I just don't stop. I just keep on going. Okay. Well, since, since, I don't, since I don't know what's happening here, you may be doing everything already <laughs> that I might suggest. But one of the things is that uh, years ago when I ran education I, uh, in, the car, in the car administration, we started a program called Community Schools in Boston. And uh, it was a wonderful project. We spent money to bring the community into the schools and to start after school programs, to bring the community in. We even had them set up a post office in the school <laughs> so people could come in the school 
you know, to go to the post office, uh, to get any way to get people into the schools. And they also got um, um, uh, college students to come in and work with the kids in the schools. And they had all these after school programs and it worked, but then the administration changed and we got some problems and it was all abolished. So I don't know whatever happened to it. Uh, but uh, I was in New Orleans, I'm staying in New Orleans for a little while now, and they had a crime task force meeting uh, that the mayor had uh, the other day about teenagers and crime and schools and all the rest. And all the adults talked and talked and talked. And then some teenagers came in the room and said, can we say something? <laughs> and so they said, the mayor said, yeah, go ahead and talk. So they said, first of all, you don't have any after school programs in the schools, for people like us. You used to have some, you don't have any, before Katrina, you don't have any now at all. <laughs> Secondly, you used to have a summer program for us, and you don't have any at all. You used to have jobs programs in the summer for, and you don't have any at all. And they named all the things that they don't have any of at all. <laughs> So they said, you sitting up here talking about how do we have time to engage in, you know, harassing people or stealing somebody's car or doing something or not going to school, but you're not, what are you, what are you doing for us? And the answer was nothing, <laughs> basically. Um, and so they need to uh, step up and do uh, some things. I don't know what you are doing. I would hope that college students would be involved. We have a program at Penn the West Philadelphia plan, which is done, I'm sure, originally for PR purposes, because almost everything is. Uh, but uh, the poor community in West Philadelphia was adopted by the school. We have a school that was adopted by the university. And students go there and, and, and work with the students. They have after school programs. They have weekend programs. They have all kinds of stuff. They have tutoring and college students from Penn sign up for a course in which they do this kind of work. So I think it's important uh, that that kind of thing, if you're not doing it, and if you are doing it, you ought to do more of it, because <laughs> it can never be too much of it, okay? And that's the kind of thing I would do. Thank you so much. Can we give her a really big Salem State applause? We really appreciate you coming here today. Um, I'd like to bring back to the podium uh, Dr. Kaja Valens, who has some final announcements, but I do appreciate everyone for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, and thank you, Dr. Barry. I really, um, we are here to learn and to take the next action, and you are leading the way, and we are ready to follow. Thank you so much. Um, thank you all for coming. We're going to keep going. Um, February is Black History Month. We are celebrating black histories and black futures. Um, please come to join in celebration and action events um, that we will be supporting on campus. Thank you so much.